Coach, uh, I know you're a passionate guy. You know, you go all in. You qualified your athletes to the Tokyo Olympic Games. You guys are going there. Can you just, no filters, just walk us through the feeling? I, th I think the first thing I'd like to say is the athlete qualified the athlete to Tokyo. I just helped. I just facilitated. Um, it's been a long road for him, you know, with the extension of COVID. Emotion-wise, I don't think I'll feel it until probably after tomorrow. But in terms of the athlete themselves, you know, he's deserved it. You know, he's been standout for so long. And, and to get the validation is, is just the icing on the cake. Well, congratulations. Can you walk us through a little bit from your perspective as a coach of the day of competition today, you know, first fight, second, and then the yeah. qualifying match? Yeah, so um, it, it's a tough one because he was number one seed. And um, everyone then says you should qualify, not you could qualify. And, and that in itself is, is like you carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. And you could probably see that in the first fight a little bit. He's, he's not had that many competitions, obviously, with COVID, as many people haven't. And Richard is someone who likes competitions to get into the flow of things. So I think the, f the first fight was, was more of a mental battle than anything. Um, and he dug deep there. He showed a lot of character. Um, when, once he got through that, then, then my own feelings were a lot calmer because I know that then Richard gets hold of himself and can compose himself. And for the second fight, he, he was a different person. He was very relaxed. He was very calm. Even at 1-0 for two rounds, I don't think there was a time I thought, I thought we wouldn't win that fight. Um, it's the kind of game that, that Richard gives heart attacks to other people, but he controls very well when he's on the mat. And the third fight, you know, Julio Ferreira is, is an enigma in Taekwondo. He's fantastic to watch. He changes stances. He, he plays some unorthodox game, but he has real structure in his own head to it. So... And they've had some really good fights before, and they always usually go to Golden Point. The last time was in the Grand Prix final in Moscow, and it was Golden Point. We managed to nick it that time. But all the way back in the European Games, he beat us Golden Point for the bronze medal. Um, so it was nice not to go to Golden Point. And I think, I think the fight was exactly what it should be. It's a tight event. It's an anxious event. You know, both, both have chances. Both have potential to go ahead. Um, but in the end, I think, I think the, probably the person who just did a little bit more in terms of the, the high point challenge and, and executing a little bit um, probably won through. Perfect. One question before uh, I let you to John. Uh, what a special year, you know, we talk about athletes, but as a coach, you know, this, uh, this event was supposed to happen a year ago and then everything got, pu got pushed uh, for your preparation to prepare an athlete. You know, you didn't have any, it's all uncertainties, you know. Uh, how did you manage to keep your athletes engaged to make sure that they can be ready physically and mentally? You know, what was the process as a coach to prepare an athlete and making sure as today he well, can be what, ready? What we tried to do was we, we tried to have like a, a neural switch off period, if you like. It's probably the wrong term maybe, but so, so we would train for three weeks and usually after three or four weeks in normal season, you'd have a competition. So I'd give the athletes a week off and then we'd come back and we'd train for three or four weeks and we'd have a week off. And so it allowed them to reset. So every time they came to training, they, they came with a little bit more freshness and a bit more quality and maybe even a little bit more innovation. They might've been watching some different martial arts, some different combat sport, Taekwondo, etc. So. It, it was a challenge, and we always say to athletes, you need to be comfortable with uncomfortable, but um, the practice of that is very, very difficult. Um, so what we tried to do is listen to the athletes. We talked a lot to the athletes about, would you like certain times off? Would you like to do other things? One time we did contemporary dance to change it all up, because when, when there's not an a outcome target for an athlete, it's very hard for them to just keep embedding themselves in quality over and over because it, it's not so much the physical but the mental wear it, it just it it brings an athlete so far down that they get on top of themselves so we tried to work a lot on a few innovative things like I say contemporary dance some weeks off just sometimes playing Mario Kart in the Dojang etc and, and we tried to just make it that yeah it it's a crazy period and it's uncertain but as long as we're together as a group and we're all going in the same direction and there will be an end in sight, you know, everything will be good. Well, very inspiring and it's refreshing to hear that, you know, from a coach. And John, if you want to go ahead and, and ask some questions as well. I do indeed. First of all, congratulations, Dave, to you. That's, um, you know, back-to-back -back Olympic Games, getting athletes uh, there. You mentioned contemporary dance, but they're, of course, now going to the big dance. So I wonder, 
if you've had any thoughts about preparations for Tokyo, given the fact that Richard specifically has had COVID, had had to come through that, the physical preparations, you probably had to adjust it to, you know, balance his energy. It looks, hopefully you'll get a free run now for the next 80 days through to Tokyo. What does that look like in, you, in your mind? Because I know the athletes celebrating and you're already writing down what you're going to yeah, do next. Um, yeah, Richard actually had, had COVID, not, not to the extent that many people have, it, have had in the world, thankfully. Um, but he did have it quite bad relative to everyone else in the team. Um, and Richard is very much a person who, when his energy is up, his game is on fire. When his energy is down, just like anyone, he gets a little bit of uncertainty. So I think first, first things first, he'll have a break. He'll enjoy himself a little bit. He'll have some time with his girlfriend. You know, he'll have some time with his family, etc. And then I think I'll sit down with him and hopefully with some other athletes from tomorrow if we can qualify more. And, I, and I'll discuss with them how they feel, what they feel is the best preparation for them. Then I'll put my, if you like, two penneth into it, my thoughts into it. Um, and then we'll come to a little bit of a conclusion because it's, it's very difficult for me as a coach to think I know the correct way of doing things. I know the models. I know the the theories of things, but these are living it every single day. And I think it's important that we listen to them when we're at this level and that it becomes very relational, even in the process up to something like the Olympic Games. We have to trust them. 100%. And that trust, I'm sure, will be evident in Tokyo. But also the key question that's on everybody's lips now is, is there any video footage of that contemporary dance? And if not, why not? I actually don't know. There might be, but I struggled in it as well. Um, but some of them were good. Some of them were actually good. But the person who took it, Lena, who's from our Olympic Centre, she's, she's an exceptional dancer. And she works a lot on functional movement with the athletes and, and range and mobility. And, and, and she's a real asset in, in all the sports at Olympia Open. But I will find the video and I'll send it you over on WhatsApp, mate. And you can do with it what you... I'm waiting to see it. I'm waiting to see it. The last point I want to make is Richard alluded to it. He's, there's got friends and club mates and teammates from way back. What about that support team that's around you? Maybe give a name check to a few of them. It's from, from day one, you know, when people left this team, people still stayed involved in this team because this is their baby. This full-time system is what they created. And, um, you know, we had Bendik in the first cycle who was putting his body and head on the line. Today we've had Mohamed El Hatri putting his body and head literally on the line in Richard's warm-ups. Um, we've had Randy Dingland putting her body and head on the line. It, you, you can't ask for more, you know, and, and you ask athletes to, to be willing to give their all for their country, but it's rare that, that it's possible. And I can only commend the team that we have around, from, from Hella, who organises logistics, from Mikkel, who, who was the assistant coach in the first run-up and half of this run-up, you know, to, to the new people. We have a 17-year-old girl now, Mare, who, who's a delight to coach. She's just refreshing. And... You know, the future's bright for Norway, and at the minute, I, I really appreciate the, the support that we have from the group around. Fantastic. I wish you the very best of luck tomorrow. I hope it all goes well, but congratulations on today. Cheers, John. See you later, big man.